we're talking our upcoming biomechanics level one certification may 24th through 26th right here at canyon view high school so right off the bat go ahead and hit us with what this is yeah so we're excited about this one because this is a step in the direction of where i really wanted to take performance health for a while i uh, just been you know anxiously waiting for this moment and here we are so this is our first introductory level one foundation and for context it might seem a little confusing but there's actually five levels level zero being foundations so of where do you want to do with strength condition what do you want to do with strength conditioning why do you want that and then giving you a format or what we're calling your how to get to know what you want but that's like should be preceding any of these things and the message if you're a young strength coach listening to this is all of this is with the intent to get you through this five level certification, knowing exactly what you want. And then after that, making the necessary investments to improve as a strength conditioning coach. So we start off with that level one and the easiest way I can categorize this and we'll break this down a little bit more in detail, but it, the exercises you, you use with your clients or athletes and how to execute on that on a daily basis. And then that goes into level two, which goes through, how do we select variables based off your physiology? So sets, reps, time under tension, rest intervals, intensity, how many days a week do you train or frequency? All those are not necessarily foretold. And I think we need to have a better trigger or indicator to selecting those things. And then it goes into general program design from designing a training session, a micro cycle or a training week, a mesocycle or a block of training weeks, and then a macro cycle. And the foundation of all of that is preceded with level one and level two. We're going to select the right exercises. We're going to have the right variables. And then we're going to integrate that into a more of a training program that stretches out over a day, a week, a month, and even a year. And then the final level is level four. That's your advanced methods. That is the the fun part, but also too, needs to be predicated with a really solid foundation. And we don't want to just haphazardly choose exercises or sets and reps or throw that in there with a gener general like training system. We want to have a really strong foundation of I'm very deliberate with why I choose a certain exercise and I know exactly why I'm choosing that. We want to be extremely conscious of there's a way to optimize those exercises with sets, reps, intensity, time and retention, rest and, and frequency. Then we have to integrate that into a, a, a more comprehensive program that's going to get us to point B most efficiently. Then we can get to the advanced methods and looking at alternative forms of resistance, looking at certain protocols and methods, the integration of exercises and certain sets and reps that will yield a certain outcome. And then looking at it from dynamics that we can really extrapolate a high level outcome based off of a, you know, a certain situation or circumstance that we need to do, like maybe two a day training or super compensation cycles. That will be the, the culmination of all this other foundational stuff, but you got to earn that. And you got to get to that point where you have a really strong foundation of all stuff. Cause I don't want to speak in these terms that are going to come to the point of like, I had to so much stuff that prefaced that when I get to these high level strategies, I want to be able to have a, a, a structured education and curriculum that builds into this final outcome of we can get really granular and specific and nuanced as long as we have a strong foundation of nomenclature and why we're doing what we're doing and how to execute on that. So that's the, the 10,000 foot view. And this first one will be here May 24th going through biomechanics and exercise selection. So it's a three day course. Why don't you go into what each of those days entails and what we're going to dive into? Yeah, there's going to be three primary focal points. Testing, using certain tests from more objective global type of things like a jump or a Nordic or a ab adduction. And this is a utilizing software and hardware from Vald. Uh, but there's plenty of other testing units that we can dive into, which we will, because that's one of the things that I want to really pride myself on is that this is in a promotional aspect. This is something that I've been in your shoes. I know exactly how you're feeling when you go home and you don't know how to integrate this because you don't have those testing tools. So we're going to elaborate on alternative forms of testing, but it goes from this global to very local. And we're going to look from a jumping pattern or going into a general movement screen to breaking down several movements and seeing what some sort of 
indications of certain exercises being good or bad. And then we'll get into more localized, looking at joint range of motion and trying to take this big, big, big data set and forming that into the next level of this focal, this whole level one is exercise selection and programming that we're going to choose exercises off of these buckets of general patterns of push, pull, hinge, and squat within various directions or vectors and various stances like unilateral, split stance, bilateral into, all right, what's the best exercise if we find this indicator or what's the, the best way to look at a general pattern-based program and finding the exercises that would be most conducive to overall development. So the final aspect, and this will be the funnest part, is technique and execution. And when we look at those big three of testing, programming, and then coaching, we're going to get a really comprehensive view of how to look at exercises, how to optimize those exercises, how to make sure that we're replicating our skill set over and over and over again. So when we come back to that level two, we now have a foundation of, I know how to select exercises, program exercises, and then coach those exercises in a way that makes me far superior to maybe some of my counterparts or enhances my clients and athletes for performance immediately. But then we can now accentuate that. Let's start to choose sets, reps, intensity, time, and retention. And who would you say this course is for? I'd say everyone who's working with clients. And I know that probably seems like a broad general, but you know, the, the thing that I can really attest to is I have 15 years of experience working in the college and the team sector. I have now seven years of experience working with Gen Pop. And the, the overall approach really is I know how to select exercises for any situation or any environment. And I can tell you in a one-on-one -on -one why I choose what I do for a personal training client. I can tell you in a large group of 150 guys we had at Army West Point or, or 15 on a basketball team, you know, how I'm selecting exercises in a very succinct manner, because that's the, that's the thing I've had to face is I've had to replicate my skills. I've had to teach and I've had to educate. So we have a really, really interesting dynamic from an educational perspective from extreme practical application. Where I would say, if you're going to ask me to differentiate performance health and my teaching, relatively speaking, anyone else's, no one can hold a candle to my practical experience. The other issue is no one can hold a candle to me and having to replicate my skill set at scale. You know, I have three gyms. We have 600 members, 30 coaches. I've had to figure out how to explain and systemize what I do at a level that is now being replicated by 30 coaches at a really high level to the point where it almost makes me obsolete. And that's a valuable message to you. The person's like, why should I go to this? As you're getting someone that's comfortable being a conduit to you being better. And when I start to think about my role and my legacy, it's not a matter how much I know and not how much I can silo off and make myself indispensable. It's how much I can impart upon every coach around me and making them better because the, the end result is good training is all that really matters in the end. And you can't reach every single person in the world, but if you can reach coaches that are connecting to these clients and athletes or this one-on-one -on -one or a team sector, you're going to have a better chance of making a dent in the universe. And that's my whole focal point is, you know, I know your situation, trust me, I do. And I also know that when you go into education, the expectations, you're trying to figure out how to apply what I'm telling you is the best way to train in your setting. And I'm telling you it's the opposite. I'm figuring out your situation. I know your situation and I've formed this educational platform to meet you where you're at in your current role and situation and make sure that you provide the best quality training to your clients and athletes. And that in itself, when you're thinking about who does this apply to, applies to everyone because this is a universal model that I've had to figure out how to replicate over and over and over again and having really good feedback off of that didn't work. Okay, I got to figure out this aspect. I got to refine that. I got to re-explain that. I got to organize this differently. And now we're at a really good point where you can capitalize on that 20 years plus of experience and then also how to replicate that over and over. That actually is a good transition into my next question is what sort of hands-on experience are, are is an attendee going to get? Because it's one thing, like you said, to have the information, but then you got to learn how to apply it in your setting. So what are we going to do from a hands-on experience point? Yeah, we're, we're going we're gonna to feel all these tests, right? So day one is all about testing. 
and we're going to go through all of the testing and there'll be lecture, but there also is going to be a, a practical aspect and we're going to get involved with all those global to local testing where we're going to get feedback on how to do it. You're going to get coached up on how to do it. You're going to get put in the right position. Uh, simple things like, you know, how do you explain this? How do you give your quick, succinct description of this, but also to get through a high volume of people or get through a high volume of tests with one person in a, in a brief and hopefully efficient manner? You know, that, that process of of, oh man, this is going to burn you if you don't really start to refine this process or explain this more succinctly. Then too, of where do you stand? Where do you organize yourself? Testing someone else, getting tested yourself and using all these practical experiences to go back and go, okay, I have a really good understanding of what this should look, feel and smell like within my setting. Then the other part will go into the exercise selection. And when we're breaking down certain exercises, you want to have a rationale and be able to explain it. Right? Explain it to a Martian. That's kind of the message we'll be able to go through of why you chose a certain variation should be very readily understood, even most transparent, right? It should be extremely consistent. That's the part when you're starting to select exercises, not from a generic template, but from a very systematic approach of compiling data, finding out what actually is significant, and then selecting a variation of an exercise or an exercise itself over and over and over again, because when we start to give yourself like this teasing out of what actually what we're doing, it's a grand experiment. It's looking at what is your training program yielding? It's a research design. It's supposed to get a certain output or expect, expected output. How do we get that conclusion? And if we don't have reliable testing methods, a, AKA exercise selection or research design, and then testing methods, how do we actually integrate that exercise into a session? We're not really gonna get the output or it's gonna be surprising what we get. And then the final aspect is the coaching or the technique and the standard. And we'll break down really the big three of demonstration, description, and then actually coaching. But if we're looking at this from the context of, all right, you're just gonna leave here getting really good testing, no, that's. That's a third of this. Hey, you're going to get leaving here with just really good exercise description. Again, that's just two thirds of this. We're going to finalize that with coaching and holding a standard that anyone who's ever coached with me would probably attest to this of you're only as good as what you can get someone to do. Like a bad program executed well will probably be superior to a good program executed well. Well, why not have both? Let's have an amazing program that's executed violently well, that's going to get an outcome that you understand or at least you anticipate is coming. And if you can get that, then you are by far and away that much more ahead of the pack in terms of delivering a program that, quite frankly, gets results every single time and gets it in a faster and more rapid with less cost from a structural damage or emotional damage or whatever other things can come. We want just great output without any unnecessary sacrifices. And that's going to be the foundation of this whole entire four-level certification process. You mentioned Vald in terms of some of the testing we're going to do. Can you dive into like what specifically with Vald are we going to do? I know we got some other tests lined up. Can you dive into that a little bit as well? Yeah. So Vald is a hardware software company. They have a variety of testing hardware. A couple to come to mind would be Forstec, Nordboard, Forceframe. They also have Dynamo. They also have Speed Track and some other units. The idea behind Vald is we have objectivity with what we're testing, right? That that I could get someone with very minimal understanding of of looking at biomechanics and get some sort of hard objective data, right? And one of the areas that we'll talk about would be a good litmus is if your athletes can self-administer test and if that information is valid, right, or reliable. And one of the things that you'll find with Vald or there's several other testing components out there or testing units that if you can have that as a foundation for collecting data, then you're gonna have a high frequency, high yield input or data input that you can leverage towards selecting better exercises. And one of the things that's so valuable about Vault is all of the tests which we're gonna talk about between Force Deck, Nordboard, and Force Frame are all both intra and interlimb assessments, right? So I can look at the difference between your left and right. And what that discrepancy is from a, a multitude of metrics within that one test, as well as I can look at the intra limb, right? So for instance, let's look at something like ab adduction, right? So I can look at right, left on both ab adduction, but I can also look at it from 
that single limb, well, what's the difference between the ab adduction on that right leg versus the left leg? And all of that, all that does is triggers to me is some more questions I should be asking, right? So I just found a whole host of asymmetries when I jump, when I do a Nordic, when I do ab adduction. Okay, that could mean, relatively speaking, nothing, or it could lead to a whole other aspect of, I need to ask more questions. I need to dig deeper. And that for you is something as a coach to start to accept that, okay, that I don't want to like, assume I know everything about the client or athlete that I'm working with. And one of the things that we'll, we'll talk about early is when we work with someone new, there's a, a default or there's a, a preconceived solution that we traditionally go into. So for instance, Hey, Corey, nice to meet you. I already have your program written. I don't know anything about your biomechanics or your physiology or even your psychology, but I already have a program written and I'd be lying to say that I haven't done that. But I would also say that now, since I've evolved and getting getting results that necessarily that I didn't anticipate or even want, I've had to come back and full circle go, okay, it's probably better to gather that information, but there's an opportunity cost, there's a sunk cost, there's a, is this worth the time? And I think that's the part that you have to evaluate in your setting. And what Vald really has allowed for me is to get rapid information, like it's under a minute if you really do this right per person, you get a whole just gambit of things that you can assess, not only from a baseline screening perspective, but from a KPI. Like, right, we haven't, we're not even broaching the subject on the actual performance aspect of this, like what your jump height is, what your RSI is, what your impulse is, all these big fundamental metrics that will leverage towards the second level. But in the foundation of this, you know, honestly, it's just about saying, okay, if this person's asymmetrical when they jump and land, or when they do a Nordic, or when they do ab adduction, what does that mean from a programming decision standpoint? And I could stop right there and say, maybe I just need to do more unilateral work until this clears itself up. Or maybe I need to start to do asymmetrical loading with dumbbells as opposed to barbell. It could mean that's something right there, right? And you could get to a point where everyone has some sort of asymmetry and it's probably just a safer bet to do unilateral and asymmetrical loading. Or we could say, I'm not changing my program until I corroborate that information with more data. And I start to look down the road of, okay, well, what does a functional movement screen look like? What does a isolated joint test look like? And that's what we're kind of doing is we're giving you some sort of, hey, we want to gather information here. And from there, it's probably going to behoove you to get more, but you can stop here and start making good training decisions right away. But if you have more time or if it's kind of worth that investment to find more out about that individual, and there's going to be a couple triggers for that of maybe they're coming off an injury or a surgery, or maybe that they have a really high standard deviation of asymmetry, or maybe it's just quite frankly, the person has a little bit more individual need. They're paying for one-on-one. -on -one, they want to have a little bit more customized aspect. Okay. Well, I'm going to dig a little bit deeper and I'm going to go through a functional movement screen and then I'm going to go through a table test looking at isolated joint actions of passive and active range of motion of the, of the, the big, the big six actions of a joint, right? Flexion, extension, ab adduction, internal, external rotation, and what is actually necessary information, relatively speaking, to program design. And I can start to go, okay, I've gone through this whole process from a big global to a very, very microscopic local. And I can say, probably without a hesitation, that there's going to be exercises that are now contraindicated and I have to make a decision from a training or a programming standpoint. And that will be the next phase of this. It's getting to the exercise selection and going, there is there is a difference between programming for one-on-one -on -one versus a large group. And, you know, we have to make some sort of, I don't want to call it a concession, but a compromise with working with larger groups, right? That having a very individualized, very singular thing. And a lot of times when we get to this big scaled out thing, we start to look at the trigger or the indicator to select an exercise for one person for the others. A lot of times just subjectivity and over time, that's not repeatable or scalable. And you're going to get a lot of discrepancy with the results that you're getting from your program versus, all right, this person, this group over here had asymmetry above 15% when they did a counter movement jump, or this group over here had 15% more in terms of asymmetry and a Nordic, or this person has massive discrepancy intralimb looking at ab adduction and what that means for an exercise going forward and how we want to maybe start to select or organize those exercises, right? So exercises are going to be those big four, push, pull, hinge, and squat. But then it could be, 
hey, I'm going to do more horizontal pulling versus vertical pulling, or I'm going to do more unilateral lower body pushing versus bilateral lower body pushing, or it can mean I'm going to do more knee dominant posterior chain as opposed to hip dominant, or I'm going to do more horizontal pressing as opposed to vertical pressing. And then it get into the, hey, well, what, what is the organization or the implement that I want to do? Maybe it's a split stance, a lateral stance, a some sort of transverse orientation of the feet. Maybe it's a asymmetrical loaded with a dumbbell. Maybe it's a offset load with one dumbbell. And all these things just layer out to, it's infinite what exercise you can do, but we want to start to reduce that number down to things that are even more, more effective and tangible, and then tying that into looking at the actual range of motion or the function of a joint, and simply applying these simple rules or fractals of, if they don't have the range of motion passively, everything else on that is going to be altered or affected. And if I want to go below parallel and squat because that's my standard of movement and I don't have adequate knee flexion, the chances of me getting that based off of whatever exercise I choose is reduced and lessened. And I could coach it as hard as I possibly want, but it's square peg round hole. And I want to be aware of that information before I'm presented with that information within training so I can organize it as effectively as possible to put that athlete or client in the best position to be successful and then just go to work, coaching it hard every single day because that's the thing that's going to make the difference. But I just want to be in the best platform or foundation to have success with my exercises before I even touch a barbell or dumbbell. So as, as you – oops, got the bell. One second. But I would tie this into uh, this other aspect that there is an in-person – and then there's a remote aspect. And the attendees get access to 12 online modules. And what I would preface that as is it's a more models-based approach. It's looking at biomechanics as a, as a science in itself and being exposed to concepts like movement variability or open versus closed drills, and then looking at things like gear ratio or mechanical advantage, looking at other aspects like tensegrity, looking at, looking at the joint, looking at the muscle tissue, looking at contractile versus non-contractile tissue, looking at all of these variables that we need to just be conscious of and aware of. Some of it's going to be intriguing and interesting. Some of it's going to be review. But the notion that we can walk into a biomechanics course and not having a discussion off of what is the actual foundation of, of knowledge here and being exposed for? Because I'm going to talk about the, the inputs from an exercise selection standpoint and how to leverage screens and testing to get the best exercises and then coach those exercises. But within that, there's underlying physiology, underlying actual science that predicates a lot of this stuff happening or not happening. And there's a, we'll find out there's a limitation in passive range. Okay, that's just information. But there's no real knowledge of how that came to be or why that is. It's maybe tissues have developed and become fibrotic or not necessarily structured in a way to create range of motion. And, you know, you could just take that as like, all right, I know they can't get to that. And I don't want to really care about the underlying physiology or, hey, I want to start to create better responses to that from soft tissue manipulation or myofascial release, different flexibility or mobility type of drills, or integrating that into a compound movement or a multi-joint movement and sequencing that from a motor learning perspective. And, or I want to get this transition to an open environment with that person's organic and reflexive in that, and that stimulant to that stimulus that allows them to be successful time and time again. You know, that's the part where if you're breaking down those three days in itself, worth it. Like, absolutely. If that's all you do, I'm, I'm telling you, you're going to get a ton from this. But it's a 12 online modules that I think will differentiate in a way. And it's just going to open up Pandora's box, right? It's going to give you tons of articles and tons of books that are foundational in nature. And, and giving respect to a lot, of, a lot of the platform where this information came from, right? We're, we're going to dive into some high-level thought processes that it's not mine. It's not, it, it, I've organized in a way that's proprietary, but the other aspect of it is, you know, I'm standing on the shoulders of giants and leveraging their systems and leveraging their thought processes. And, you know, that element has evolved into boots on the ground. How do I take all this information, compile it down to something that's replicatable? And that's where you're going to get it, but you'll get the, the foundational knowledge as well as that. So you get 12 online modules with 
with dozens of interviews that I've talked to other strength coaches about how they should be approaching that and thinking that, but you got 20, 25 hours of, of content and material to work through outside of the courts itself. So this is a, a tremendous value overall, not only three days of probably the best, best education you get from biomechanics and exercise selection, but 25 hours of, of information to dive into that will quite frankly make you feel like overwhelmed in a good way. Cause this is like, yeah. this stuff's out there. Like, Holy crap. Well, like when's the last time someone talked about gear ratio with you? And if you don't know what that means, you will. Yeah, no, I'm actually going back through the modules right now myself. And as I go through, I'm like, Oh yeah. Like, and then you just realize how deep into the weeds you can get, but then you got to dial it back. Like, Oh, I'm in a group of 50 kids. Okay. That's not necessarily applicable. And as yeah. I hear you talk about it, it we're more giving you a framework and like all this testing is like how to think, how to ask better questions so you can get better answers to make better decisions. Would you add anything to that? Yeah. One of the, one of the notions that, Hey, I'm going to have to completely rework my entire philosophy. I, mm -hmm. I, I don't agree with that, uh, that assumption. Cause what, what reality is, is you've came to a philosophy or a standard operating procedure out of some sort of, evolution to survive in your environment. And the, the area that I, I really want to hopefully let everyone who wants to attend this think about is there's no biomechanical laws, right? So the example of being at, Hey, I squat one way, you squat another way. And let's just use a back squat as an example. So there's a lot of things to think about when we're thinking about a back squat, right? And Anyone who's ever coached by me, I, I, I tend to think about things as if I do it a certain way, redundantly to threshold, what is going to be the, the second order, right? Is it going to manifest into higher cross-sectional muscle area force, maybe rate of force development without any other things that happen because of it? Great. If I do it a certain way and has a lot of biomechanical negatives, right? We start to get restricted in our actual ability to move through a full degree of a uh, hundred percent degree of freedom of the knee and the hip, maybe in the ankle, then that's something I want to consider. So a rule would be, Hey, I want to do below parallel squat with your torso perpendicular to the ground. And I want to utilize a implement, a stance that facilitates that. Now that's a rule. It's not a principle, meaning that you have an environment where that may be not necessarily what you value or you view. And my point to you is what would be the, what would be the indicator for doing a high bar below parallel back squat versus a low bar to parallel back squat? And what is the second order from that? Cause we're going to push it redundantly. So we're going to do this for multiple reps for multiple sets for an extended period of time within the training session, multiple times a week or multiple times in a month. What is going to be the outcome of that? And, if it's 100% net positive in terms of better force production, better velocity, be able to go whatever direction you want to go with speed and amplitude, sure. But the other end of it, if there's some sort of orthopedic cause from low back pain, hip pain, knee pain, ankle pain, shoulder pain, or if there's a biomechanical adjustment that you start to leverage different positions, we should at least have some sort of perception of that. And aside from force velocity profiling, just looking at it biomechanically, we strip away whatever inputs we're going to put on top of the exercise from a sets, reps, intensity, time under tension, rest, and frequency standpoint, what would it look like? What does the machine look like as it moves freely? And we create rules off of that, right? And the thing that I'll talk about within my setting, and keep it simple, stupid, but it gets into this, does it hurt? Don't do it. If you can't do it slow, don't do it fast. If you can't do it light, don't do it heavy. If you can't go through a full range of motion, don't load it partial. We should at least rule those things out and create some sort of foundation of rules. So when we get down to boots on the ground, myself knows the assignment that those are my like five foundational rules that I need to go through as well as my first year coach, or, Hey, I want to replicate what I'm doing from one client to the next, from one client's first 16 pack to the next 16 pack. So I can start to rule out whether it was an execution or program design start point or on the other end of it, was it a hypothesis in my training, right? I thought we're going to do four days a week, upper, lower split, and we're going to use all these advanced level methodologies that didn't get to an outcome, but it was executed really well. Okay, so now I understand that my execution being the foundation of the research design, I can rule out the testing methods, and it was a bad hypothesis. Versus if I have bad testing methods or in maybe not great technique or inconsistent technique or execution, I don't know what the hypothesis, what that contribution was or wasn't. 
And I think that's the part as we start to look through this and, you know, talking about really what we're trying to accomplish with this is understanding the assignment and saying all an exercise is, is a conduit and conduit. And we can start to look at that of what, how do I leverage that conduit to getting an outcome? I create rules and my rules in my setting are mine. They might be some carryover or crossover, but you have rules in your setting. Like how do you organize and navigate a couple hundred high school athletes? And I'm working one-on-one. What are the rules there? They're just a conversation to be had about there's, there's no universality to, to training biomechanics, but there are some things within your setting that you start to look at and like, wait, this is how we become successful over time from having these repeat exposures and making sure that we're doing our best job possible. Yeah, you nailed it. I am pumped to get you out here, Tim. I'm so excited. So if you listen to this and you're like, yeah, I'm on board, which you should be, absolutely, no doubt about it, head to phpodcast.com and make sure you get registered for this bad boy because we are going to be having some fun for sure. Yeah, there's going to be uh, some discounts available for a period of time, so 25% off. If you're a member, you get an additional 25% off to 25% off. So if you're not a member, make sure you become a member. So you're looking at yeah. almost 50% off Huge. if you're a member, which is a pretty f- profound and amazing deal. So get on that. And again, you get those three days. You get access to those 12 online modules and dozens of interviews. And then the other end of it. It's you get access to the system and you get discounts on the, the other courses and other things. It's it's one that hopefully builds over time. Builds, yeah. Awesome. Right. Thanks so much, Tim. Yeah, thank you, Corey. All right, later.